Good morning, everybody. Let's be finding our seats. And we are going to go ahead and get started. Hopefully you're prepared for what the Lord has for you today. And, and I do encourage you, like Josh was announcing, invite someone out next week for Easter. There's, you know, there's a couple times a year we kind of, you know, carve out to, to, to move away from whatever study and just, just give a gospel presentation. And, and, and Easter's one of them, Christmas being the other. And, and so, um, I, you know, the Lord will have something for all of us in that, but we'll certainly... Uh, provide a clear gospel presentation. And so if you know of any lost people, see if you can get them out here next Sunday and, and, and they'll hear the gospel and, and, and we'll pray. Be praying this week for what God's going to do. Be praying that, that there will be a harvest of souls, that, 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 that we will see salvations uh, through that. And just be praying for everything that surrounds that and the weather for the Easter egg scramble and all that. So I uh, appreciate that. That'll be, a, that'll be a good Sunday. Those Sundays um, are always good. This past week, um, Craig and I were out of town most of the week. We were in Atlanta and Cartersville, Georgia area at the Discipleship Conference. And so um, we're going to talk a little bit about that today. But that we, had a, we had a great time there. It's always a great time of, of fellowship and, and that sort of thing. Craig, uh, Craig is, this week is spring break. I know we have a lot of people out of town on, on spring break. Craig and Katie are one of them there. I've traveled down to Louisiana to be with Katie's family this week. Um, but I just want to report to you. So Craig was the, the main speaker in the mornings, um, and he killed it. He just did a great job, and so it was, it was, it was cool to see. We had a, we had a great time uh, together, and so that was fun. But since we kind of have a, a little bit of an, an odd week here on this, you know, Palm Sunday, I, I didn't want to jump right back into our, our study in the book of Acts quite yet because cause March has been a full month. Uh, already, right? A, a couple weeks ago, we had our REACH conference, and area own preach, and then last Sunday, we had our deacon installation. That was a special service. Next Sunday's Easter. That's going to be its own special service, and, and, and so we won't even be back in the book of Acts then. So I wanted to take this opportunity uh, on this Sunday, and, and since we've been outside the book of Acts for a little bit anyway, to follow up on, on what I learned this past week, and, and also even from our REACH conference. Both of them were great conferences, and and God did, I think, I think great things. And, and for me, this past week in Georgia, like I said, it was a great time of fellowship. And we heard some great preaching and teaching that, ref, that refocused us on the one mission that we have on this earth. And that, that mission is to make disciples, right? And most of us know this quite well. We've been given the Great Commission Found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus gave that commission to his disciples after the resurrection and, and those 40 days between his resurrection and ascension and, 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 and sent them out. But, but we are to be his disciples today. And so that commission applies to us today as well. It's the same thing you see Paul saying throughout his epistles. And, and most of you know it and we read it a lot, you know, and it, certainly at, at missions conference and discipleship conferences and those sorts of things. But I don't, I'm not sure that we can ever read it enough, so I'm going to read it again. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And we have been sent on a mission. God has commission he commissioned a group of men and everyone that followed after them with a job and a mission to get something done on this earth the apostle paul said it this way in in again another popular discipleship verse that we frame everything around second timothy 2 2 as he was giving his final admonition it's the final book of of paul's life and He's given his final admonition to his son in the Lord, Timothy, and he says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. And we talk about the, you know, the four generations that we see in, in that verse. You have Paul, Timothy, and faithful men, and others also. And this helps define for us what discipleship is, what making disciples is all about. Because here we see that we've not really discipled someone until they've done the same thing with someone else. Because discipleship isn't taking someone through a set of lessons. All right? it's, it's, it's much more than that. Now, 
the lessons that, that we have are a good tool, and they help facilitate what the Bible defines as, as making a disciple. And so it's a great way to do it. But, but that's not all of it. It's the sharing of life, and it's the bringing up of someone else who can then go and do the same thing. So as a church, we're always in search of those faithful men and faithful women that we can not only lead to the Lord, but then invest into them the words and the ways of God so that they become a true disciple and invest that same thing in others. You see, what we're not, we are not trying to make church members. It's not the mission. It's never been our mission. We're trying to make disciples. And we can never forget that. And, and, and we don't want you to forget it. So we made it the mission statement of the church. We worship God by making disciples who exalt his word, edify his body, and are equipped to evangelize the world. That is the mission statement, the vision statement we have as a church. But even with the emphasis that we see on making disciples in the Bible, even though it's our mission statement as a church and, and we try to talk about it regularly, we just had a new cost of discipleship class at, you know, at the beginning of the month, and we do that roughly every quarter. In spite of all that, it's still something that we are all prone to just slip on. Myself included. I was reminded of that this past week. So it's something that needs to consistently be put into our remembrance. This is, again, this is something that we can't talk about enough because it is the one thing that we've been given to do. And God makes it very cl clear for us. But, but just because we have to be put in remembrance of it, just because we'll slip on it at times, that's okay. That, in, in some ways, that's how we are built. Peter said there are things like that in our Christian life that we know. We know we've heard them. We've been taught. We can even talk about them, but we just tend to forget them. We tend to forget the, the, really what it is in the midst of everything that we're doing. We forget what it is that, that we're really supposed to be doing. So we need to be reminded in 2 Peter chapter 1, Verses 12 and 13, Peter said, Wherefore, I will not be neg negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. And so there are, are things that we know, and, and certainly we've learned and we have intellectual knowledge and even means something to us, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be reminded of them. We need to be put in remembrance and, and constantly reminded of those important things. And again, when we talk about the mission and we talk about making disciples, most of us in here know it. But it becomes so easy <clears throat> in the midst, and this is the, the lesson for me and the lesson for the leaders around here, it becomes so easy in the midst of just having church every Sunday to just have church. But listen, having church isn't the mission. And, and, and we end up just holding services and, and doing, you know, what we do on Sunday morning and Wednesday nights and those sort of things and somehow forget about the mission. Because again, church services aren't the mission. Making church members isn't the mission. And church services and church members are important. They help us facilitate the mission. We aren't going to stop holding church services, and we're not going to quit adding new church members, but, but we can never forget what it is that we've been called to. And, and just as that applies to us as a church, it certainly applies to us individually. That same truth holds. Because you know just as well as I do that we can get so busy in life that if we're not careful, we're doing everything but the mission. And, and it may even seem like things are going well. And work is going well. And projects around the house are getting done. And the kids are involved in all sorts of cool stuff. We just forgot about making disciples. And listen, we can't forget. Because the mission is what life is about. And it is what we are all going to be held accountable for. 
There's coming a day that every Christian will stand before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ and we will be judged on how well we lived our life on mission or, or not. Or maybe we didn't. So we can earn rewards or the Bible says we can suffer loss. And it's not the loss of our salvation, but there is a, a loss aspect that we can even see into, 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 into the millennium and, and, and through that. So we can't lose sight of what's important. But when it comes to our remembrance, I don't believe that just simply remembering that we are to make disciples is enough. Again, I think we all remember that at, at some level. We all know it. I think we need to go deeper than that. Because I think what we lose sight of in the midst of the busyness of life, in the midst of, of the busyness of church and the busyness of ministry, is what we really lose sight of is the real motivation. The real motivation to, 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 to be able to then look beyond just life's circumstances and see past that and see what's important and why it is that we are to do what we are to do. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, the deeper things that we need to remember <clears throat> in order to stay prepared for the mission. Because, again, making disciples, it can't just be a box that we check. Right? That's, that's, not, that's, not what it's, that's not how God designed it. It can't just be a function we perform, right? And we, we, we slide it into our schedule. All right, I have discipleship on Tuesdays, right? I make disciples on Tuesdays. I don't make disciples any other day. <laughs> I make disciples on Tuesday between 6.30 p.m. and 8 p.m. That's when I make disciples because that's when I'm meeting with my disciple. Okay, well, no, that's not. That's not it. <laughs> it's, it's way deeper than that. It, it can't just be a function we perform. It needs to be a motivation of our life. And I think Paul lays out for us the motivation, these deeper areas in which we need to remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And these, these will really give us, I believe, the, the proper motivation to stay in remembrance, to stay where we need to be mentally, to be able to do, and, and spiritually to be able to do what it is that God's called us to do. And, and, and we could break down this entire chapter. Actually, the first two chapters of this book are all related to this topic, but we obviously don't have time for that this morning. I just want to look at the first five verses. These are some of my favorite verses um, in Scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 5. So this won't be a, a, a deep dive. This won't be a comprehensive look. But I do think it will provide the basis for a working biblical definition of mission preparedness or what we need to remember to stay prepared for the mission. So I'm going to look at these verses together, and then we'll, then we'll break them down. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 1, Paul, obviously speaking, says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom but a demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And those are great verses that I think, again, are going to provide for us a framework of, of biblical preparedness this morning. So before we get into our study, let's go to the Lord in prayer and, and ask him to meet with us uh, this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for the time that we have to, to come together into your house this morning, to, to worship you, to, to sing praises to you that you're so deserving of, and then set aside a time to open up your word and ask and invite your Holy Spirit in, into our lives to, to teach us and to conform us more and more into your image and, and to show us this morning what it is that life is about, what is important, and how to stay in remembrance of that and how to stay prepared for what it is you've called us to do. And so, Lord, I just ask that everything and just pray and, and that everything that is said this morning is true to your word. I pray that you're honored and glorified through it. And again, that your spirit would do only the work that it can uh, to work in our hearts uh, for your glory. And we ask all that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this is a you know, it's a popular passage. There's all of the Pauline epistles, you know, for the most part when it comes to the church are fairly popular. If, if you've happened to have been on a missions trip with me, I have likely asked you to memorize these verses. I, I, I will usually use them as, as the theme verses of, of, 
nearly every missions trip that, that I lead. And, you know, many of you have heard these preach. They, these verses certainly make for good preaching. <laughs> and there's no, there's no doubt about that. But I do think there's some things in here, some depth in here that we sometimes miss. And I think what Paul outlines in these verses give us the keys that we need to, to stay prepared, to stay mission-minded, to keep ourselves in remembrance of the important things that we need to, to remind ourselves of and, and give us the real motivation behind all of it. And it starts with this. Again, we're not, we're not doing brain surgery this morning. Now, again, I, I think there's some things people misunderstand about these pa- this passage, and we'll, we'll talk about that when we get into it, but very simple. Um, the first is we need, to, we, we need to remember the what. You know, real, real deep here. We need to remember the what. And what we need to con- constantly put ourselves in remembrance of. This is something that we need to work on daily. Is that we need to remember what it is we are doing as we evangelize and make disciples and as we live out the Christian life to God's glory. And we find the what in verse 1. Look there with me again. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. So the what is about our declaration, right? When it comes to the mission, this is about our declaration, what we are to declare, right? And I think I put that on the outline sheet, so let's, let's jump that over there. The what is about our declaration. But there's a risk we face. Again, I talked about that. There's a risk we face in the busyness of life and even in the busyness of ministry and church. And the risk is we momentarily forget what our job is as a Christian and as a disciple maker and specifically what it is we are to be declaring. Because what Paul tells us is that is that we are to be giving out to others what we are to be declaring from our mouth is the testimony of God. And there are two aspects of the testimony of God that I want to explore over these next few minutes this morning. And, and the first starts with you, and it starts with me. So, so let me ask you, do you have a testimony of God in you? Do you have a testimony of what God has done in your life? Is there something that you can share with others about how God changed you and how he's currently changing you? Because if you do, you should share it. Our testimony is the greatest evangelism tool that we have. And not only that, Not only can our testimony be used evangelistically, it certainly can be used that way and should be used that way. Again, it's the greatest evangelistic tool we have in our belt. Our testimony can also be used with other disciples and to strengthen them when they hear what God's doing in and through us. But listen, if you, a, a, a testimony should be an ongoing thing. And so this is the, this is the problem in, in most Christian circles today. Is we have a testimony of what God did back then. We have a testimony of how God saved us. And, and praise the Lord. I mean, that, that's great. That's absolutely where it should start. But you do know that salvation is a, a birth, right? Not a death. <laughs> Salvation is the beginning and not the end. And the sad fact of Christianity today, specifically in this time of Laodicea, is people, many Christians, have a testimony of when they got saved, but they have nothing else to talk about. Nothing else to share about what God is doing in their life now or what what he did yesterday. But it's not to be a one and done. We're to have a testimony of God as how, how he's consistently working in our life. And God wants to use that to connect with someone else, either through salvation or, again, through discipleship, however it may be. 
Paul told Timothy to never be ashamed of his own testimony, even as a young man, right? 1 Timothy 4.12, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Those are all present tense. He also said to never be ashamed of the Lord's testimony, nor of Paul, his, his father in the Lord. In, in 2 Timothy 1, verse 8, he says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. And, and so the, the thing is, is, is we need to continue to remind ourselves of what it is that God has done for us and is doing for us. But not only that, examine ourselves to see if we have something to talk about today. To see if God is still working or did he only work at the the day that you you walked an aisle or the day that you sat down with another person and, and gave your life to Christ. Was that the only day that he worked in your life? I hope that's not the case. But, but listen, because here's how you can continue to have a testimony. Here's how you can take the testimony from, from when you got saved and, and then use it to then allow God to work in you from there. There's a way that you can do this. It's by never forgetting what it is that God did for you. Never forgetting what he did for you And using that as the motivation to live your life according to his word. To be about the mission. To be faithful to evangelize. To be faithful to make disciples. Don't ever forget it. Don't forget what he did. Don't ever get over it. Don't ever lose the awe and thankfulness to God for what he has done and what he continues to do. That is such a danger for us and a risk for us. And again, in the midst of just the busyness of everything we do and the busyness of having church and the busyness of life is we forget just how good he is and just all all that he has done and continues to do. That was Israel's problem. You can trace Israel's problem to a a lot of things, but it's, it's described pretty succinctly in Psalm 106, verse 21. It says, they forget God their Savior which had done great things in Egypt. They forgot. And, and, and life hits you. And life comes fast. And life hits you with hard things and, and difficult days and, and difficult things to deal with. And in the midst of that, in the midst of dealing with everything it is, it becomes so easy to forget all the great things that God has done. But it doesn't change. It doesn't matter what you are dealing with. I don't, I don't, I don't say that unsympathetically. It, it certainly is, there's very difficult things. But what I'm saying is it doesn't matter in the sense of it doesn't change who God is. And it doesn't change what God has done and all the great things. And we need to constantly remind ourselves of that. Because when we forget it, it just leads us to a bad place. I mean, that's what happened to Israel, and it led to their murmuring, their complaining in the wilderness. And that seems to be true in churches as well. And We don't remember how good God has been to us personally. We forget that maybe we should treat others with kindness and love and forgiveness. And listen, when you forget that, you have a tendency to lose your testimony, what it is that you are to be declaring. And that's what Philippians 2, verses 14 and 15 says. We looked at those verses last week. We won't look at them again. But when you lose your testimony, the testimony of God suffers because you can't declare it. But then secondly, we also find that the testimony of God not only resides in us by sharing what God has done in and through us, but the testimony of God resides right here. (laughs) This right here is, is 66 books. It's 1,189 chapters of the testimony of God. Of what it is he did and what he continues to do today. So we have his testimony in his word. So the next logical question is, are you able to share God's word with others? 
Because after you share what God has done for you and in you, the next step is to be able to take them to God's word and show them what he can do in them. And we're all at different spots, right, in our spiritual walk and our spiritual life. And some of us have been saved many years and others maybe just a few weeks, a few days, whatever. So the question about your ability to share God's word, it really gets to this. Are you doing what it takes wherever you are right now, wherever you're at in your spiritual walk, to learn more about the Bible? Are you trying to learn the Bible? Is that a, is that a desire of yours? Have you been discipled? And if not, why not? Why don't you sign up for the next cost of discipleship class? That'd be a good thing for you. But if you've been around a while and you've been saved a while, I hope you can share God's word with someone on some level, right? Maybe maybe you don't understand all the deep things of God. That's fine. I don't understand all the deep things of God. But we ought to be able to help someone in their spiritual walk and ought to be able to sit down with someone and open up God's word and be able to talk through it at some level to help them walk the walk that they're trying to walk. Because that's exactly what they need. They need the wisdom that's found in this book. That's the only thing that will help them. That's the wisdom they need to make the decisions in life that they need to make. And it's the wisdom we all need. That's where Paul goes. I mean, he spends the whole first two chapters of 1 Corinthians on that. But he, but he goes immediately from our base uh, text. In verse 6, he moves straight into talking about that. So in, in, in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world. We're not sharing with them the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world, not, or, or of the governments, or what they say. That's not the wisdom that we're sharing that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God. And a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world under our glory. And that is the wisdom that we need to know and that we need to share. So that means we need to constantly be learning. Because listen, as believers of Jesus, the wisdom of God, you know, found in this book, found in his testimony, it has been entrusted to our care. And we won't go there, but in, in, in chapter 4, it talks about we're the stewards of the mysteries of God. And and there's a, we don't have time to lay it all out for you, but, but even those verses I just read, there's a connection, like in verse 7, between the mysteries of God, the wisdom of God, the wisdom that's found in that. And we've been stewards. We've been made stewards of that. And, and so the, the thing that's important for a steward is to be found faithful. Right? And so we're to, we're to be found faithful. We've been entrusted with God's word. And we're to guard them with our life. 2 Timothy 1, verses 13 and 14 says, Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. The thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost, which dwell in, in us. And we're to, we're to keep them. That word keep means to guard. And we're to guard this wisdom with our life and, and share it with others because of the value that it contains. It's... it's unspeakable riches is what Paul says. This unsearchable, Ephesians 3a, unto me who am the last of the least of all the saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. You see, the apostle Paul felt it a great privilege to be allowed to preach the word of God. He didn't look upon the mission with, with drudgery or servitude. He entered into it with intense delight. And listen, you know, we can read his story and see what all it caused him, the physical affliction and tribulation and persecution that it caused him. And, he, and he, he outlines a lot of it in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, there at the end of that chapter. Just the simple fact of preaching the gospel, what it brought to his life with respect to, you know, the, the, just the physical um, turmoil and, and tribulation that he had to face. And yet... He counted a joy, he says in the book of Philippians. He, he says, man, that I, who am I that I should be able to do this, that I should be able to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ? That's the value he thought it contained. That is the value of the wisdom of God. And I think that all of these verses and these phrases should challenge us to view our ministry of declaring the testimony of God 
at a very high level, right? Peter said that we have been given exceeding and precious promises. That's the testimony of God. They're exceeding and precious. They're the unsearchable riches. And we have access to this wisdom. And yet, too many times we don't do anything with it. And we're not serious about the value that it contains, not only for us, but for others. And so either we keep it to ourselves, or, or we don't even spend any time in it ourselves. So we need to remember what it is that we've been given to do. We are to declare the testimony of God and what he's doing in us and, and what his book says. So rather than reflecting on the many ideas that are around today about what makes for a good discipleship pro program, or rather than, you know, focusing on, on the latest book by the, you know, the latest, most popular Christian author of the day, I find that the verses I read and the phrases that I read highlight for me the most important thing. There aren't unsearchable riches found in books. I'm not opposed to reading books. I read books, but there aren't unsearchable riches found in there unless they're quoting God's word. And that's what we've been called to declare. Not our own ideas, not anyone else's ideas. We've been called to declare the testimony of God, what he has done in us and what his word says. And that's what we should spend our life doing. You know, 2 Timothy 4, 1, 1 and 2, popular verses. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season, out season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. Preach the word. But, but to preach the word, you've got to know the word at a certain level. And it doesn't say preach about the word. Preach the word. So don't forget what it is that we've been called to do. And the second, the, the second thing we need to remember to keep us motivated for the mission, and that's to remember the who. Remember the who. And by this point, I just mean who it is we are pointing people to. And now, this seems obvious, and it is obvious, but it's a struggle for many of us. And we see who in verse 2. Paul said, For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. All right, so, so, so verse 2, sometimes people confuse this a little bit. And, and, the, and they'll say, you know, all Paul cared about was preaching the, the gospel. Well, of course Paul cared about preaching the gospel. I mean, he, he talks about it over and over and over again. He talks about it in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17, about preaching the gospel. But, but that's, that's not actually what this verse is saying. And Paul goes on to say throughout all his other many other places how he preached the whole counsel of God. And again, those mysteries get to the depth of the wisdom of God that, that he was a steward to. But, but, but anyway, so, so I don't want to discount, of course, he cared about preaching the gospel, but, but, but that's not what this verse says. Verse 2 isn't about our declaration. What we are to declare, what we are to speak, is a testimony of God. Right? So verse 2 isn't about declaration. Verse 2 is about knowledge. Who it is you want people to get to know through your declaration. And that person has to be Jesus more than you. Now, now hopefully it's both. Hopefully they get to know you and Jesus as you're in the process of making disciples. But first and foremost, Paul wanted the Corinthians to know Jesus. And so while the, the what is about our determination, or I'm, I'm sorry, the about our declaration, the who is about our determination. He says, for I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul said, I this is something that I made a determination of. And that was the context of the first two chapters of 1 Corinthians. Paul was saying over and over, I wanted you to know Jesus more than even me. Or, or more than the other guys ministering to you. In fact, Paul was upset that the Corinthian believers were identifying themselves with the preachers instead of Jesus. In chapter 1, starting in verse 12, he said, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? 
I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any, of, any should say that I had baptized in my own name. And listen, this one can be difficult because making disciples is about sharing your life with another believer. So, of course, they need to get to know you. You should build a close relationship with this other person. In 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. But the truth is, too many times, either consciously or, or maybe subconsciously, we pass on to our disciples things that have nothing to do with Jesus. In the, and, and in and of itself, that might be fine, but sometimes we pass along things that are counter to Jesus. And that's not fine. And this is something we have to be very careful with. We want our disciples to be followers of us, but only as we follow Christ. And if you have areas in your life that aren't Christ-like, don't pass that along. And again, I'll, I'll admit, this one is difficult. And we have to be very careful to, to, to not point people to us more than, than, than we're, you know, we're trying to point them to Jesus more than to us. And and it can be difficult because in our nature, which is sinful, by the way, that old man still around, we like people looking up to us. That's, that's in us, and there's nothing wrong with it in and of ourselves, because it's fine as long as they are seeing Christ in us. But there's a great danger if they don't. And the danger for us is pride, because it becomes very easy to fall in love with the love of man. And when we do that, we quit pointing people to Jesus. And, and whether we know it or not, we're just pointing people to us. This is the problem with the Pharisees. John 12, 43 says, For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. So listen, Jesus alone is who we want people to get to know. But if you have a follower, you're making a disciple, you have, you know, you're leading people to the Lord, and you're receiving the praise of man, it's easy to begin to think that, man, man, things are about me a little bit, or because of me at a certain level. But if you think that way, man, you're, you're just playing in right into the devil's hands. You know, Peter faced this temptation after he and John healed the lame man in Acts chapter 3. We, we went through that um, in some detail, but I'll, let me just remind you, Acts chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. So they heal the lame man that had been there, you know, laid at the gate of the temple 40 years, and everybody knew who this man was, and now he's up walking, and it says when, and when Peter saw it, which was speaking of the people's response, how they were, you know, in awe, he answered unto the people, ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this, or why ye look so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we made this man to walk? The God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus whom he delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. And what Peter did is, you know, people were looking, and it's like, man, all this cool stuff is happening. And, and this man gets healed, and they're like, oh, they're, you know, they're gods, Peter and John. And, and Peter's like, hold on a second, no. Why do you think that that had anything to do with us? We're just the vessels. And so he took the focus off himself, and, and he pointed people back to Jesus. And and listen, and this is like some harsh words I'm about to say, but the truth is to not do so is satanic. But because that was the original sin, that was the, 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 the pride of Lucifer. He made those five I will statements that we, that we find in, in Isaiah 14. And, you know, Paul talking about the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4 said, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. And, 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 and we just have to be very careful in this because, myself included, for every single one of us in here, this, this is a risk. But we have to be careful because it's something God hates and it's something he ultimately won't stand for. Now, he's long-suffering, so sometimes he doesn't deal with it immediately. And, and that's good for all of us, by the way, because we're idiots at times. But ultimately, God won't allow it forever it will be dealt with eventually. Proverbs 16, 5 says, Everyone that, that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. That's a strong statement. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Like, what a scary verse that is. I mean, seriously, pride is, 
such an issue in our lives, and, and yet we tend to just gloss right over verses like this. And we ignore them. Um, we shouldn't. Because it won't end well for us if we do. And listen, don't think you're not at risk. Every single person in here, starting with the guy talking, we are prone to it. And we all face it, and it's deadly. Proverbs 18, 12, before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty, and before honor is humility. And this is one we must get right. And so I've told you this before. I've even put this exact sentence on your outline sheet before, but it's important enough I wanted you to, to, to see it again. The biggest danger we face in this life is pride, period. It's not who wins or loses the upcoming election in November. Is not infl- As bad as inflation is, that's not our biggest risk. The biggest risk we face, especially in making disciples, is pride. It's, it's selfishness. Doing what we want over God and pointing people to ourselves more than to Jesus. And so we all need to be on the lookout for it and be prepared for it, especially as we get involved in the mission. Because the further along, ago it, you, the further along you go in ministry the more you're going to be tempted by it, I promise you. And this is at least true for men, and particularly those in leadership. So we at least need to know. We, that we need to remember. We need to remember this and be prepared for it because Satan is always trying to deceive us on this front, and we're susceptible. 2 Corinthians 11, 3, he beguiled or he de- deceived Eve. And then down in verses 13 and 14 of 2 Corinthians 11, we see how deceptive he can be. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. He's very deceptive. So we're warned to not be fooled by him. And don't let the devil tell you that you're okay when God is revealing to you that you are not. Because if you let it slide, you'll be deceived. It's what pride does when it's not checked. In Obadiah verse 3, we've seen this verse before. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. I mean, listen, the pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? And, and the problem with that verse is, is if you live in pride long enough to the point of deception, one day you'll get the answer to that question about who can bring you down to the ground. And you might not think anyone can, but But you'll learn that's not true. That is the promise of Proverbs 16.5. The pride will not go unpunished. So, do you believe that verse? Do I believe that verse? Let me give you another one to ponder. Listen to Proverbs 8.13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. Okay, so, I mean, so these, are, these are the simple things that we need to ask ourselves. So we, we read a verse like that, and then we need to honestly examine and say, okay, based on this verse, do I fear the Lord? Because if you fear the Lord, you'll point people to Jesus, but if not, you won't, and, and there's, there's reasons why. Because that verse says very clearly the fear of the Lord is to hate evil colon so so I think you guys know know, basic grammar but a colon means what's after the colon is going to define or describe further what was before the colon so okay so how do we define evil pride arrogancy A froward mouth? That defines evil. And we're to hate it. And it says, if you fear the Lord, you will. And yet, we give ourselves a pass. For whatever reason. So so do not say you fear the Lord if you are consistently prideful and arrogant and have a froward mouth. You're lying. It does not work that way. Now, that doesn't mean you won't mess up sometimes. Of course you will. We all mess up. But there is a difference between messing up and having a lifestyle where you have accepted those things about yourself. That's different. 
And if you've accepted those things about yourself, you've been deceived. And, and your day's coming. That's all I can say. And this is a battle, man. It is a battle. And it is a battlefield. We know the battlefield is the mind. Because the mind controls the heart. That's why Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as a man thinketh in his heart. Right? Those seem weird. Seem, seem weird. Like, you know, as a man thinketh, you would, you'd, you'd think it would say, as a man thinketh in his mind. It doesn't say that. It says, as a man thinketh in his heart. Because our mind controls our heart. There's a, there's a great biblical link between mind and our heart. And so this, this gets to our mind and where we think, and, it, and, and it's so important because it ends in our heart. So staying sober-minded about the mission, about who it is we need to be pointing people to, is so important. That's why Paul says this is about determination. I've, I've just determined. I've made up my mind. Right? This is about the mind. I've made up my mind. I don't, I don't want to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's who I want you to know. I want you to know Jesus through this. And it's difficult. It's a decision we must make every day because it deals with what's going on internally in our heart. And it's something we can fake in front of others, but the Lord knows our heart. So make the decision. Determine for your disciples to know him even more than they know you. But you can't do that if you live in pride and if you don't fear the Lord. Only the humble will point to Jesus. But listen, Jesus is the only one that can bring about life change. We can't do that. So remember the who and don't think it's you. But there's one more key this morning, and that is we need to remember the why. Back to 1 Corinthians 2, look at verse 3. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And so Paul reiterates some of the previous points, how he was humble, how he was spirit-filled, he was preaching the word of God, not the wisdom of men. And he says all that to get to the why. And what we see here is the why is about our demonstration, right? Our demonstration. What exactly are we trying to demonstrate in our disciple-making and living life and ministry? Is that, is, are we trying to demonstrate that we know a lot about the Bible? Because what we see here is that what we are to demonstrate is that the power of God only comes through the Spirit of God. That's what we're trying to demonstrate. He said, you know, but his, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And when our life demonstrates that, when people see the Spirit of God come alive in us through sharing our testimony and how, how this book has changed us and how it's continuing to change us and all that God's teaching us, then proper faith is built in others. And that's the why. To build faith in our disciples. That's verse 5. He said, my demonstration, I want to demonstrate that the power comes through the Spirit of God. Why? So that your faith will not stand in the wisdom of men. It's not going to stand in me. But in the power of God. And so that is why we are to do this. To build faith in our disciples. To build faith in our families. To build faith in our ministry teams. Wherever it is, we should want God to use us to help others in their faith. And that will only happen when our faith is real. We don't want our lives to point someone else to human wisdom. It should show them the power of God because that's what's going to build their faith in God. And that's what we are to do. But listen very carefully. Our life will only demonstrate Holy Spirit power and build faith in others when through the Holy Spirit, the Word of God builds faith in us. It's the only way to get it. We cannot pass along something we do not have. And if we're faking it, we can only pass along man's wisdom. We can only pass along some knowledge, but not power, not real faith. Paul said his life and his preaching was a true demonstration of how the Holy Spirit works. Is yours? Is mine? That question scares me to death. So the Holy Spirit has to be working in us as we are working in the work of making disciples. And the only way for the Spirit of God to be working in us is to allow the Word of God to work in us. Because the Spirit of God responds to the Word. And we are only filled with the Spirit as we allow the Word of Christ to dwell in us richly. 
Compare Ephesians 5, verses 18 through 20 with Colossians 3, 16. So at the end of the day, real faith comes from a refreshed Christian. One who has been refreshed and renewed in God's word himself. That's where faith is built. That's where we get to demonstrate the power of God as we let the word of Christ dwell in us richly and change us and we get refreshed. And we see a beautiful picture of this with the manna that God provided the children of Israel in the wilderness. And many of you know that story. God provided manna for the children of Israel every day. And we see all the pictures of how manna points to the word of God. It was the bread from heaven. And bread in the Bible is a beautiful picture of the word of God. Exodus 16, 4, then said the Lord unto Moses, behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. The people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, and I may prove them whether they walk in my law or no. It's the bread from heaven. It, it, it pictures God's word because Deuteronomy 8, 3 says, And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So he makes those connections for us there about, bre- about manna with bread and bread with the word of God. And this picture is relevant to our point this morning because, because there's an interesting passage in Numbers chapter 11. And I want you to see this. Numbers chapter 11, verses 7 and 8. It says, And the man was as coriander seed, and the color, thereof, the color of delium. And the people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills or beat it in a mortar and baked it in pans and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. And again, this is a, a picture, but I want you to see the picture from the perspective of a Christian who is about the mission. Because God gives us the prescription for mission living here, for anointed ministry through the fresh oil of the Holy Spirit. Oil in the Bible is a picture of the Holy Spirit. That's what we're talking about, right? The demonstration of the Spirit's power. And it begins with us taking the manna, the Word of God that's available to us every day, and gathering it, right? And the people went about and gathered it, the beginning of verse 8. And the word gather is the same word translated glean in places like the book of Ruth. She was allowed to glean the corn from Boaz's field. And there are all sorts of pictures in that. But staying mission-minded starts with the word of, of going to the word of God and gathering it for yourself, gleaning from all of God's wealth to feed yourself. But then you have to grind it. They ground it in mills or beat it in a mortar. And then there's there's a process of grinding or beating, and and, and maybe some of you do this yourself, right? There's a a process of of milling uh, wheat. So, like, if you just take, for example, uh, a a wheat berry, right, and you want to mill it and make your own flour, right? That's a very popular thing uh, these days. But the process of grinding or beating the wheat, what it does is it takes a wheat berry, and you grind it, and it separates it into various pieces. This is the milling process. So the milling process in a wheat berry separates the endosperm, the wheat germ, and the wheat bran. And those are all used for various products, and they produce various types of flours. Or you can put them all back together to create whole wheat flour. If you ever heard of whole wheat flour, that's all of the flours put back together after they've been separated. So there's some stuff in there that's good, but it doesn't apply to maybe what you need in the moment. The point is, after you gather the manna, you have to start to take it apart. And you see what can be used here and what can be used there, how it can be used all together. Solomon describes this same process in fools. The problem with fools is just you can't always separate the foolishness from them. Proverbs 27, 22 says, Though thou shouldest bray a fool in a mortar among wheat with a pestle, yet will not his foolishness depart from him. And bray means to beat or to pound, and a pestle is a grinding tool. And for the fool, God tries to beat it out of him and just doesn't always work. Same is true for parents too, but that's a different sermon. But listen, God's word is always divided perfectly. We just have to know what to do with it. We have to gather it, and then we have to work it. And I don't know about you, but this process sounds a little bit like 2 Timothy 2.15. It says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be in the shame, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what the grinding process does. So, so to rightly divide, you have to grind. To study, you got to grind. you got to work it. 
But here's the thing. When you grind wheat like this, the flour doesn't stay fresh forever. The flour we buy from the grocery store has preservatives in it. You know, it, it lasts a long time. When you're doing this process, it doesn't last forever. It has, it has a much shorter sh shelf date. That's why the children of Israel had to gather and work the manna every day. And that's true of us as well because this is what we need. We need God's word every day. In fact, in the book of Nehemiah, the daily provision of manna by the Lord was described as one of his mercies. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 19 says, Yet thou in the manifold mercies forsook us not in the wilderness. And now, colon, again, you know, there's the English lesson. Then he defines what those manifold mercies are. The pillar of cloud departed not from them by day to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way wherein they should go. Verse 20, thou gave us also thy good spirit to instruct them and withheld us not thy manna from their mouth and gave us them water for their thirst. So, so the giving of manna is described as one of God's manifold mercies. And listen, what you find, and I know we're running out of time here, but when you study mercies, the mercies of God in the Bible, they're consistently connected to the, the truth of God's word. That's where you get them. Right? John 17, 17 talks about thy word is truth. Right now, I want to show you the first mention of the word mercies in the Bible. It's Genesis 32, verse 9. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, the God of my father Isaac, the Lord which said us unto me, return unto thy country and to thy kindred. I will dwell, dwell well with thee. Verse 10, I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. The mercies of God are connected to the truth of God. In fact, Psalm 85.10 says mercy and truth are met together. All right? So the Bible's clear here. And, and, you know, think about this picture that I'm painting. We receive God's mercies as we go gather his word, as we start to grind it, and we start to work it in our life. And how often should you do that? Well, Lamentations 3 says his mercies are new every morning. I knew every morning. So, you know, maybe we should spend time in God's word every morning. I don't, you know, I don't know. I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but. But as we spend time in the book every day and we begin to grind it and divide it and see the beauty that is contained in this book and receive those daily mercies to feed ourselves, that is the motivation that we need to worship him properly in our life and stay prepared for the mission. That's why Paul says in Romans 12, 1, as he's talking about us being a living sacrifice, the true definition of worship. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the what? The mercies of God. Because that's the motivation. That's the only motivation you can have to live the life that we've been called to live is the mercies that God provides for us in his book as we get up every day and we go gather it and we begin to work it and we begin to grind it and it opens our eyes to the beauty and the unsearchable riches that are found in it. And it gives us the motivation to live our life, the sacrifice. Look what it did for Paul in Romans eleven thirty three. 33. He says, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. And because of that, he says in verse 36, for of him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. My life's yours. Because this book, is a, it's, it, there's nothing like it. And as I take the time to spend time in it and see how it applies to me, it changes my very being. And then what do you want to do? You want to share that with someone else. Now that you're in awe of God, because this process goes on, because after you gather and after you grind, what do you do? It says you bake a cake and you consume what God has for you. Kind of like Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Thy words were found and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me, the joy and rejoicing in my heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord of hosts. But listen, here's the thing. You don't eat cakes or loaves of bread on your own. I mean, maybe you do, but you shouldn't. <laughs> They're meant to be shared. And it tastes good because it's fresh. And it tastes like fresh oil because it's been anointed by the Holy Spirit. And you're demonstrating the power that's through him. And this is how we can make application of verses like Psalm 34, 8 for ourselves and for others as we make disciples. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Psalm 119, verse 103. How sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And this is how your time in God's word, anointed by the Holy Spirit, can help someone else taste how, just how good God is. 
How gracious he is. And that is what builds their faith. Not your knowledge. Not how cool, the cool things you know about the Bible. And build faith in anybody, including yourself, by the way. What builds faith is seeing the beauty of God through the beauty of his words and the mercy to get through the day, the mercy that he has for you to survive the life that we have to live. And we put that together and we get to taste just how good he is. And you get to share it with someone else and it builds faith in them and it's how God set this thing up to work. Don't do it yourself, you can't. You will demonstrate your own foolishness if you do that ultimately. We are to demonstrate his power through the Holy Spirit of God. And there's one way to do it. Spend time in his word. Know who, because listen, this thing brings it full circle when you do it this way. Because when this plays out in your life, you are declaring the testimony of God, what God's word has done in your life. And in doing so, you're pointing people to others and not yourself. And that's when the mission is real. And that's when it's exciting. And that's when it's worth sacrificing for. for. And that's what we should never forget. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. And I know we're running a a few minutes late, but I, I, I don't want you to lose sight of what God wants to do in your life this morning. And if... If God's speaking to you and there's, there's anything that, that you need to speak to him about, you should take the time. You should do it there in your pew. You should come forward this morning and get right with him. And if, and if there's anybody in here that doesn't know Jesus, if, you, if you've, there's never come a time in your life that you've placed your faith in the mercies of this book, in the truth of this book, and what he said about himself and, and, and how, a, according to the scriptures, he died and rose again on the third day, died for your sins and for mine and, and, and you haven't placed your, fi- your faith in the finished work of that on the cross, you should do that today. And if you have any questions about that, come forward. We'd love to talk to you, show you out of the Bible what it means to be saved. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for your word and, and the beauty and the unsearchable riches that it is. I pray that you use it in our life to mold us more and more into your image so we can make disciples uh, the way you've called us to make them. We love you and we thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand. We'll close out this service and a final song of, of worship and, and pray.